the completed video. After a few days, the completed video will be added. Oh, I have to give it permission, I guess. Um, added to our YouTube channel. Um, we were saying earlier, we have over, over 90 videos on the YouTube channel on Little Compton subjects for you to enjoy at your leisure. Um, and we will have questions and answers at the end of the talk. Christine will monitor that. So if you have a question, um, type it into the chat option. Absolutely. Uh, and Christine will read me those questions at the end of the talk. Um, and she'll be monitoring it through. So, oh. um, you know, and let's say I misspeak or say something confusing. Christine's monitoring those questions. If there's something that she feels I should answer right away, she'll interrupt me and we'll, we'll handle it right away. Um, all right, so again, welcome everyone. I'm Marjorie O'Toole. I'm the executive director of the Little Compton Historical Society. We're so happy to have you with us this evening. Um, Christine Aguiar is our program manager. She's gonna be helping with the coordination tonight. And I am gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay, that, it looks good to me. I'm hoping everybody can, um, can see the screen. And there, and now we can change it. Okay, John Simmons. John Simmons, born and raised in Little Compton, a very accomplished man in 2008. He was one of the dozen people selected to have their biography included in an exhibit called uh, Remarkable, uh, Little Compton's Remarkable Residents. And in 2008, that research for the John Simmons uh, chapter in a pamphlet that we produced and the section of the exhibit that we created was done by a woman named Piper Hawes. Piper Hawes was on our board for many years um, sadly, she passed away this fall. Um, 2003 was a rough year for Little Compton and for the Historical Society, and we lost several um, people who are very near and dear to our hearts, and um, Piper's loss was a hard one. Um, her husband, Sandy, passed away, I believe, just a few weeks before she did. Um, so Piper was an exemplary uh, board member. Actually, the next screen has her picture, so I'll switch to that. Um, exemplary. Um, and also a Simmons College graduate. Uh, she was enthusiastic and excited to do the work on John Simmons, and she did a really wonderful job um, and enlisted others to help her. So we were collaborating with people from Simmons College, um, we were collaborating with an author, Denise Pappas, who's on line with us tonight, um, who wrote a book about John Simmons, and, and Piper just did a super job. So tonight, much of what you're um, hearing is Piper's work, um, some is Denise's work, and um, also uh, when we're talking about John's father, Benoni Simmons, it's the work of Dr. John Concanon. Uh, a Revolutionary War researcher who's done a lot with Benoni Simmons and very kindly um, let me know what he discovered. So in 2008, the Historical Society produced this, uh, an exhibit and this pamphlet, Portraits in Time, Three Centuries of Remarkable Residents, and John Simmons was one of them. And certainly a very fascinating life for uh, a little boy born in Little Compton who attended, um, you know, to a farm family and attended the one-room schools. Tonight, we're going to talk about his ancestors a little bit, both his dad's side of the family and his mom's side of the family, who's equally fascinating. Um, we'll talk about uh, John's career, really his tragic uh, family life and his legacy uh, which is Simmons College. Uh, so um, fascinating life, and um, we'll approach it tonight from a very uh, hometown local 
point of view. So John Simmons was, was the seventh generation of Simmons men um, in the United States. Uh, you can see on the list, the first in America was Moses and Sarah Chandler, and they came over on the fortune uh, a year after the Mayflower in 1621. And his first connection to Little Compton, although none of these folks came to Little Compton, was um, through Mercy Peabody, the daughter of Elizabeth Alden Peabody, who did come to Little Compton. Betty Alden, Elizabeth Alden Peabody, came to Little Compton um, in her 60s with some of her adult children, and they um, settled on West Main Road in the area right across the street from the Historical Society. Some of Betty's adult children stayed in the Duxbury area, including Mercy Peabody. So uh, John's grandmother was living in Little Compton, even though his parents were still in the Duxbury area. The first in his direct line to come to Little Compton, William Simmons, who married into Little Compton's church family, and they came here in 1692. Um, uh, followed by Joseph and Rebecca Wood. Joseph, you'll notice underneath on his bullet, he's referred to as a gentleman. So in official documents in Little Compton, his deeds, his will, he is referred to as a gentleman. That is someone who has achieved a level of success where they own land, but they do not have to work that land with their own hands any longer. They can afford to have their sons or their hired help, or in some cases, their indentured or enslaved workers work the land for them, and they are above manual labor at that point. Joseph's son, John Simmons and Lydia Grinnell, another fan fascinating Little Compton family, moved away from Little Compton and settled in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. And that is where their son Benoni was born. Benoni is our John Simmons father. And we're going to spend a lot of time tonight talking about Benoni because he was fascinating, a real um, Revolutionary War hero and patriot, um, along with Nancy Bailey, John Simmons' mom, who, uh, much to my delight, actually has things written about her. And that's really quite rare for 18th century, early 19th century women to have captured the attention of local historians and to be written about. But we know uh, interesting things about Benoni and interesting things about Nancy. They were both remarkable and they produced this remarkable child, John Simmons. On the mom's side, on Nancy's side, um, we start in, uh, we start early in, um, Little Compton history, with the Bailey family, William Bailey and his wife, Dorothy, who settled sort of the Bailey's Ledge Golf Club area and were a very successful family, large farm, large family. Um, William died quite young, leaving Dorothy to run the farm. Dorothy was hugely successful. And unlike many women of her time, because she was widowed, she was able to conduct her own business take care of her own financial affairs and purpose, purchase property and own her own property in her own name. And she did that, um, uh, ensuring that there was an abundance of resources for her children. That Bailey family did rely on enslaved labor. And um, for years, they were among the more successful families in Little Compton. William Bailey is next in line with Comfort Billings, the daughter of the minister. You'll notice both Dorothy and Comfort were widows for many, many years, followed by Mary, the next in line, widowed for many years, 57 years, and Cornelius and um, Mary had all girls. So this is a, a very strong female line, Nancy Bailing being one of their girls. Benoni and Nancy married, um, they settled, in Little Compton. And when they settled in Little Compton, they settled on Bailey land, not Simmons land. 
um, which is not unheard of, but it is less common for young couples to settle on land from the wife's side of the family than land from the um, husband's side of the family. And Nancy, uh, Nancy was 17 when she married the 29-year-old Benoni, and she was also widowed for 20 years. Benoni, I think his earliest and maybe his most exciting claim to fame was one of the, and you know, maybe we'll call them rebels, one of the rebels who dressed up as Native Americans and went out in the dark of night in 1772 and burned the Gatsby. Um, this is documented in his wife's um, widow's pension request to the federal government. Those documents were um, heavily, heavily scrutinized and everything in them needed to be proved. So if you find something in a Revolutionary War pension document, that's a really good source and a very reliable source of information. So the burning of the Gatsby, as Rhode Islanders like to explain, um, preceded the Boston Tea Party and was really one of the first acts of rebellion um, in the colonies to English power. Um, and it was in response to the patrolling of Narragansett Bay uh, by a really aggressive, well, by the um, by the captain of the Gatsby, who was just really aggressively patrolling and surveilling um, the ships in Narragansett Bay um, in order to collect taxes from them. So Benoni Simmons, after the Gatsby, and he was 17 um, when he was in the Gatsby. Um, well, and let me say he was part of that Gatsby burning party because of who he was indentured to. Um, he had, from Portsmouth, he was indentured to Providence to uh, learn the trade of shipbuilding and he was indentured to John Brown. And John Brown was one of the leaders in the uh, the Gatsby burning. Um, at age 19, immediately after the Battle of Lexington and Concord, Benoni volunteered and um, served at uh, the Battle of Bunker Hill. From there, he went on ship uh, to, well, he went to Canada and then on a ship uh, in Lake Champlain, the, the Trumbull, um, he served. And in 1776, during a battle on Lake Champlain, he entirely lost his arm uh, during that battle. Um, we don't know if a, you know, a cannonball or a shot, it, well, he lost it at the shoulder. He, we don't know if he lost it immediately at the shoulder or if that was um, a result of surgical amputation, um, but it was a very serious injury and he spent 12 months in a hospital recovering from that wound. After losing his arm, he continued to serve in the military for another decade. Um, and I find this amazing. Um, his first military job was in what they called the laboratory in Springfield, Massachusetts. And it was a place that made gunpowder and ammunition uh, for the revolution. And in Philadelphia, there was a brand new corps of men called the Corps of Invalids. And they were men who were um, too disabled to um, serve in a regular unit in battle but capable of armed protection of places like hospitals and, and munitions, um, storage areas. From there, he um, served on a ship that brought the Marquis de Lafayette to New England. And the family story goes that he purchased one of Lafayette's coats from Lafayette's ser uh, servant. So if we have any Simmons family members on with us tonight, I think you should all check your attics to see if you have anything that might look like Lafayette's coat. Um, from there, he returned to the regular army and served active duty um, 
in the Rhode Island artiner artillery where he was stationed near um, Little Compton, finally discharged in 1780. Um, and he did get an invalid's pension from both the state government and the federal government after the war. Um, Benoni and Nancy were married in 1784 and settled in Little Compton. The Bailey family was a prominent Little Compton family. Her family objected to Nancy marrying. They, they called him a poor one-armed man. And um, a local historian recorded Nancy's reply. And it was, I had rather be hugged by that one arm than all the rest of the arms in the world. And we know a little bit more about Nancy because of a local historian named Sarah Sol Wilbur who wrote about Nancy. Um, Nancy was born on Valentine's Day, um, which becomes important later on when she named one of her children Valentine. Um, she was only 17 when she married. Benoni was 29. And Sarah Sol Wilbur wrote of Nancy that she was a bright, cheerful, energetic woman. Resolutely, she took upon her the care, responsibility, and labors which lay before her and brought up her seven children in habits of industry and self-reliance, which were invaluable to them when they left the little cottage near Saconet Point to make their own way in the wide world. So the cottage where the, oh, well, and before we get to the cottage, when we talk about women in Little Compton, even women from prominent families, Little Compton women were working women. Um, this is a, a Sydney Burley painting of the Bailey farm. So they would have been cousins to Nancy in some way. Mm -hmm. um, and historians talk about um, visiting the Bailey family and all the women, even the, the head of the household, are busy working at their distaffs, busy spinning um, yarn. Um, so it was, although what, Little Compton did have some wealthy, successful families, we really did not have a leisure class. Everyone was a working person. This is the little cottage where the Simmons raised their children. Um, today, it is on John Simmons Road. It was moved there. So at, during John Simmons' lifetime, it was on West Main Road down in the golf club area on the ocean, on the Saconet River side of the street. And this little map shows us exactly where. Uh, as an adult, his brother Valentine Simmons built a house across the street. This is, um, this is Sidney Burley's map also showing us the approximate location of the cottage very near the golf club. So for many years, the Historical Society thought we had a portrait of John Simmons as a, a young child. And in fact, when Piper wrote her essay about John Simmons, we all believed that um, this portrait was of the young John Simmons. Piper invited um, a woman whose name I have. Uh, Deborah Child um, to come and look at the portrait. Deborah Child is an expert in itinerant portrait makers. So these are men who would um, load up half finished canvases and sometimes the canvases were painted by apprentices back in their shops, bring those canvases in their wagons around to different towns like Little Compton, knock on your door and ask you if they would like you to paint your child's face on the canvas. So this canvas was probably all painted except for this child's face. And then at some point, the child was painted in there. This is not John Simmons. Um, Deborah Child examined it and said that the style of furniture, the style of clothing, even the haircut and so forth on this little boy, even though he's wearing a, an orange dress that was very common for boys to wear dresses at the time, um, is really more 1840s style 
John Simmons was born in 1796, 1797. So it's at good 30, maybe even 40 years too modern for it to be John Simmons. So it's not John Simmons. Um, the portrait came to the Historical Society through the Simmons family. They, they many years ago, they believed it was John Simmons. So uh, a disappointment to us all, but really a fascinating story, um, reminding us that there's always something new to learn. And it makes sense. You know, Benoni and Nancy Simmons were not people who could afford um, portraits. So it's really um, illogical that they would have had a portrait done and, and far too coincidental that they would have picked the child for the the child that eventually became famous was the child that they picked to have the portrait done. John Simmons would have and his brothers and sisters would have attended one room schools in Little Compton. This is the site of the school closest to John's house. But of course, this photograph was taken about 100 years after he would have attended school. And we we don't know what the schoolhouse looked like 100 years prior to this. We do know that in the early 1800s, before 1830, public school was not free in Rhode Island. Your parents had to pay to send you to school, and you paid by the subject. So if you went just for reading, it would be one price. But if you also wanted mathematics and you also wanted writing lessons, it would be more expensive. The town paid a portion of the schoolmaster's sal uh, salary, but the families had to make up the difference. So because you paid by subject, most families would choose to do reading, writing, and arithmetic just for their boys, who they felt would need those skills later in life. But the girls were just taught reading. And we find girls from many of Little Compton's prominent families who signed their names with X's um, because they were not comfortable with their writing skills. When you see someone sign their name with an X in New England, colonial New England, early New England, federal New England, um, it means they're not good writers. They're not comfortable writing their name, but it does not mean they cannot read because they may have very well had reading lessons but just not the privilege of writing lessons as well. John, um, John had um, a number of siblings. Um, he was the sixth of eight children. One little boy died in infancy and another was lost at sea as an adult. Um, these are two of his surviving siblings, Valentine, who stayed in Little Compton, built a house, built a larger house across the street from his parents' cottage, and then his um, John's sister, Lydia Austin. In the early 1800s in Little Compton, it was parents' responsibility to launch all of their adult children into the world. Um, that meant different things for different families, depending on their resources, and it meant different things depending on whether you were male or female. Girls, including Lydia, would have been given movable property, a household full of furniture, kitchen goods, sometimes enslaved people, all things that could move with them. Uh, livestock, calves were a very common gift for young brides, all things that could move with them to a new home typically provided by their husband's family. The boys, typically in Little Compton, were given a farm, especially the older boys, and they would move out to their own farm and their wives would, they and their wives would live near their parents, but in their own separate house near their farm. The families would keep one of the younger boys home with them uh, to take care of them in their own old age, and that younger son, the third or fourth son, would inherit the farm. And that's what we see happening in this case. Valentine, the younger boy, um, stayed home, took care of his parents, and he inherited their land, their property. Now, when John was coming of age, we had some very interesting things happening 
historically, the Simmons didn't have enough land to divide up among their three surviving boys, um, Cornelius, John, and Valentine. So Cornelius um, went to Boston. We also see lots of young men at this time losing interest in farming and looking for business opportunities instead. And this, again, this is exactly what's happening with the Simmons family. The oldest boy, Cornelius, went to Boston and started working in the clothing business, in the tailoring trade. When John uh, came of age, he was sent to Boston to be Cornelius's apprentice, to learn the trade, to also um, learn the clothing business. And Valentine was kept at home to run the farm and take care of the aging parents. Um, Sarah Sol Wilbur wrote to us about John. Sarah was just a few years younger than John. Um, she had um, documents called Some Prominent Men of Little Compton. John was the second son. His opportunities to obtain an education were very limited. At the age of 16, dressed in a green baize jacket with a small bundle in his hand and $5 in his pocket, he found employment in a shop in Ann Street. And that was his brother's shop. On this spot, he pushed through all the vicissitudes which always meet the Prentice Boy on his upward way. Now, John had been raised in a cloth producing community. Little Compton was very much a homespun cloth community. So he was familiar with that end of the business. But he did apprentice with his brother Cornelius. It began as a tailor shop. And then both Cornelius and John actively embraced major change happening in the clothing industry where instead of everything being custom made for one person at a time by a tailor, there was a switch to ready-made clothing made piecemeal, um, mainly by very poor women working in their homes. Uh, and this inexpensive ready-made clothing were sold in stores called slop shops. Cornelius changed his business in 1855 into a slop shop. And a few years later, John opened his own store nearby and married a woman named Anne Small from Provincetown. Here's a picture of Anne. Um, they had um, a number of children together, um, but truly a tragic family life. Mary Ann, their oldest daughter, survived. John died at age 25. Lorenzo died at age 19. Their daughter, Alv Alvina, survived. Theodore died before his first birthday. Three months later, Anne had a new baby boy. Um, they also named him Theodore. He died at the age of 29. So none of their boys survived. Um, two of their daughters did. Um, John Simmons' brother dies, and John kind of takes over that larger business, moves closer to Quincy Market, um, brand new store in a new style that appear, appealed to customers more than the old style, and really focused on uh, ready-to-wear fashion. He moved to a more fashionable part of town. Um, his family, he was able to build mansions for his family, and a major change and a major improvement uh, in 1846 was that um, after some convincing, which was a, a race between the sewing machine and some workers, some hand sewers, um, Simmons adopted the sewing machine and his business blossomed. Um, in 1850, he opened the Simmons Block, one of the wealthiest men in Boston, and yet not accepted into the inner Boston social circle. Here is a picture of the Simmons block, his business, truly impressive. Um, the Simmons, John Simmons employed um, four to 5,000 people all across the country because he had traveling salesmen. 
um, and they advertise themselves as um, the best clothing establishment in the country. Again, that wealth was built on the handwork of women, often immigrant women, often very poor women who were working in their homes and were paid by the piece for um for the for the garments that they turned out and in general these piecemeal women seamstresses were paid only about a quarter of what a male tailor had been paid previously so it did drop the cost of the clothing tremendously but it was an extremely difficult life for these women and and that made an impression on john simmons um, and influenced some of the decisions he made later in life In 1842, daughter Marianne elopes. Her husband is abusive. John follows them to Cuba and he literally rescues her from Cuba and brings her home. And brings her home to um, eventually Little Compton, where she does formally divorce um, this man. And John makes sure in his will that this ne'er do well is not going to inherit any of the family fortune. Um, Mary, uh, Alvina also married a man, uh, um, a man named White, who, uh, was a tailor, a simple tailor. And this was very disappointing to John Simmons. Um, but Alvina's husband was a steady, hardworking, trustworthy man who eventually earned his father-in-law's respect. Um, and upon his death, Alvina's husband is made, um, one of the um, overseers of uh, John's estate because he had reached that level of trust with his father-in-law. These are the two Simmons girls, Marianne and Alvina. Um, we were very fortunate to discover a new Simmons photo album in our collection, which has um, pictures of the family that I do not think Piper and Denise had available to them when they were doing their work. So this is, um, you know, sort of an exciting little discovery for us. Um, they did know this picture. This is John Simmons III, a grandchild who unfortunately died young. John invested in real estate in addition to um, the clothing business. He retired from the clothing business in 1858, and he began to build um, three beautiful new houses near the public garden, one for each daughter and one for his wife. All three women refused to move into the houses because they liked where they were living, and they felt that that older neighborhood um, was preferred over this new up-and-coming neighborhood near the public garden. Anne dies rather young after three years of paralysis. And um, John um, stays single the rest of his life um, with his two daughters and, and no male heirs. He, he began, or he was one of the early practitioners of a trend among uh, young people who were born and raised in Little Compton who left town and lived in other places to return to Little Compton in the summertime and spend long portions of the summer here on their family's property. So this is really one of the beginnings of one of the reasons why the summer community developed in Little Compton is because these native born kids who made great successes of themselves in other places, often in cities, wanted to return home and enjoy these wonderful um, summer in the country. Now, John would live in that little cottage, in his parents' cottage. That was his place in the summer. This is his sister Comfort Sisson's house, which still stands. And in his older age, as he became ill, he would go and stay with his sister Comfort Simmons. And it was actually in her house that he passed away um, in 1870. His will, well, and let me just back up a little bit. Um, many of us are familiar with David Patton, um, 
a Little Compton resident who was the editor of the Providence Journal, he wrote about um, John Simmons and his returns to Little Compton. Um, and let me just read a brief paragraph about what David Patton wrote about John Simmons. Simmons would take his two horse coach brought to his house in Boston to take him to the train station and would then go by first class with the horses and coach in a box car. They would disembark at Tiverton and his coachman would drive Simmons, sitting there stiff, somber, unbowing, aware of his greatness, um, according to David Patton, to the cottage in Little Compton. Um, in Simmons' will, he took care of his family members, but the bulk of his fortune was set aside to be used to found and endow an institution to be called Simmons Female College for the purpose of teaching medicine, music, drawing, designing, telegraphy, and other branches of art, science, and industry, best, cal best calculated to enable the scholars to ac acquire an independent livelihood. So there were women's colleges at this time. They were typically connected with, um, you know, very traditional institutions like like Harvard, like Brown University, um, and they um, provided women with sort of this elegant traditional education. This was a very different animal. This was a practical education that would allow women to earn a living and take care of themselves and take care of their families. And this, we believe, is directly connected um, to the hardships that Simmons saw his uh, piecemeal workers going through um, as they were sewing clothes for his business. The founding of the college, another really interesting little tidbit as to why he would think about founding a college is if we remember way back to Benoni Simmons being apprenticed to John Brown, in 1804, when John Simmons was a young boy, um, Rhode Island University was renamed Brown University because of John Brown and his family. And Benoni Simmons was known to be a storyteller. So John Simmons would have grown up hearing stories about his dad's time working for John Brown, hearing about the Brown family, you know, renaming, essentially founding a college um, in Rhode Island. And so that type of grand work uh, was a very um, real thing in John's experience. He knew of a man who helped found a college and name a college, and now he had the means to do the same. Boston's Great Fire devastated the value of John Simmons' real estate holdings and his estate. And after the fire, there simply were not the resources to fund a college. The dream was on hold. The, the board of directors, the trustees of this future college made all the right choices, invested wisely, waited patiently, and although it took over 20 years, after that period of time, there were funds in 1899 to fulfill John Simmons' wish and found Simmons College for Women. And this is a photograph of the first graduating class from 1906. Um, Little Compton is proud of John Simmons. This is his house now standing on John Simmons Road. Um, some of you may know uh, the terrible name that John that Simmons Road had before it was Simmons Road. Um, it was commonly known as the N-word lane. Um, this little excerpt from a map is from 1925, and the maker of the map was too embarrassed to write that name on the map, and I don't blame him. So he cleaned it up a little bit by calling it Angiosporum Nigerium. So Street Nigeria Street or Nigeria Lane. Um, that name persisted until about 1940 when a woman who lived on the road um, Lily and Rosa complained to the town council about how awful it was and that it needed to be changed. And 
the town decided that a much better alternative would be naming the road in John Simmons' honor. And that tells us that his house was already on that road at that time. Um, this is a Bartlett pear tree in the old burying ground on the commons. Piper Hawes uh, had this tree planted there in honor of John Simmons in 1999 in honor of the 100th anniversary of the founding of Simmons College. So we have a number of Simmons memorials um, in the community. And then our exhibit um, in 2008 brought his story to the attention of you know, the people who purchased that publication and attended the exhibit. Um, and you can see the portrait of the little boy in the back of the exhibit area that again, honestly, at that point, we thought truly was John Simmons, um, you know, and have been grateful to learn differently since that time. Um, and I thank you for your attention. We'll stop screen sharing and maybe Christine can check and see. It doesn't seem like there's many questions in the chat. I see one little comment. But if anybody has any, there's um there's, there's another one. okay. Um, so Kathleen asked. Um, she said in she's from Boston, and in her day, Simmons was always noted for library science. Do you know how that happened? Was that a, in some way a result of John, or is that maybe what the college became known for? So library science is not specifically listed in the will as. Um, one of the things I, his whole goal was what are the mm. um, respectable careers that a woman can do in order to support herself. And, and, you know, he listed quite a few in the w will. So being a teacher certainly was one. And I think um, as libraries became more popular, uh, being a librarian, started to fill that criteria. This is a respectable um, career for women, and it's a career that requires higher education, so it fit right in with the mission of the college. But it was not, it wasn't probably in his vision, because it just, it wasn't a position at that time. Um, Juliet would like to know, do you know when the little house on Simmons Road was moved from Sakana Point? Oh, she's the current owner and she would love to get that information. So I don't. Um, I was thinking about that today. And like I said, all like I alluded to earlier, they changed the name in 1940 and they suggested John Simmons as the name in 1940. So the house was there in 1940. Um, to figure that out, you'd have to do a title search and it might not even, so, so I would say after, after John Simmons death, so that's 1870 to 1940 is your window <laughs> and it's a big window. It's even, if, oh, go ahead. Even if you did the title search, you might not get an answer because you don't have to have a town recorded document to move a house that's so funny um we were it's gonna earlier... be a hard thing to figure out i'm sorry christine go ahead well uh we were actually just talking before you began your lecture about um street numbers in little compton um i'm wondering if maybe you could see like the households in censuses as you go through to be able to see like where do you understand do you understand what i'm getting at yep. like if you look at the 1940 census you're going to see that there is a household living there but if you go back you know and it's every 10 years so you could go back and see um it, it's going to be helpful it might shine some light on it but it's probably not going to be definitive the mm -hmm. censuses in little compton don't use street numbers um you have to actually wait for a pretty long time before they even use streets. Oh, okay. Um, so you can kind of get a sense of neighborhoods, mm -hmm. but even that's not perfect because if you weren't home, 
when the census taker was in your neighborhood, he would come back at the end of the census and stick you on at the no, end. No, it of wasn't. The yeah. So it's not a, it's, it, answering her question is uh, challenging and there may never be a 100% crystal clear answer. Um, I agree that a title search would be, and it, it would probably be your best chance at answering that. Um, Karen would like to know where was Comfort Sisson's house? So Comfort Sisson's house still stands. Um, it's a wonderful, almost like double house on West Main Road, fairly close to the golf course on the water side of the road. And um, if I'm remembering correctly, there's either a big rock in the front or like a big septic tank in the front. I think it might be a big septic tank that has like really pretty flowers and things on it. Mm -hmm. So if you drive by, if you, if you're driving to Sakonet Point, you'll go by the house on your um, right hand side. Awesome. Um, who asked to have the name changed from the N word lane? Lillian Rosa. She, Lillian Rosa. she uh, requested that the town council make that change. I think it was at a town meeting. She requested that change. Um, there is Lawrence and Lawrence says, oh, go ahead. So, so I'm just, I'm reading Julia's, Juliet's question. Lillian Rosa has relatives still living in town. Um, Carolyn Montgomery, who was on here earlier, knew Lillian Rosa and might know if Lillian Rosa lived in that house. So, so there's yeah, that, that, be... is that kind of uh, community knowledge would be a good way to get some information. Oh, um, Juliet says she was the former owner. Oh, okay. Um, Lawrence says that in his ancestry search, he has Benoni listed as M. Benoni. Um, do you know what the M stands for and or is that correct? What was John's dad's name? Oh, no, his name was... Oh, it's listed as M. Benoni um, on ancestry. I think that's probably an error. It, yeah, it could be how someone delineates. Like sometimes you'll see five G X, and it'll stand for five great grandpa. Yeah. Um. So that's that's probably where that. I haven't from. seen anything that calls him anything other than Benoni. Of course, Benoni is sometimes it's got one end, sometimes it's got two ends. You don't pay attention to that. And that's I, too early for middle names, right? Yeah, people wouldn't have had middle middle names at that point. Yeah. M, maybe it's missed like Mr. Somebody yeah. recently mm -hmm. transcribed Mr. Mm -hmm. Um all right. So Grace McIvergan says Oscar Sylvia lived in that house in the 1950s. Um, and sadly, we still called it that name at that time. Supposedly, it's because that's where the servants went to eat lunch at the break in the long Sunday services as the church. Yes. Uh, not it, at that house, but on that lane. On that lane, yeah. The, the white residents would go to Willow Avenue and have their break, and the um, black residents would go to that road and have their, their break. Um, Oh, and then the muds lived there after the um the Sylvia's. Um Lawrence says thanks. Um ancestry can get a little tricky. The um the best way for you to know if that would be true is if you saw like the gravestone or um, you know, if it were listed on an actual death record. But I his gravestone is in the old burying ground. He and Nancy are buried in the old burying ground on the commons. Okay. And if there's no M there, then that's probably a good indication that there wasn't an M involved. Any other questions, anyone? Well, I am curious, Denise. So so you wanna unmute yourself, Denise? And Thank you. Um, yes, thank you so much, Marjorie. Um, I'd like to tell uh, the audience that Marjorie was incredibly generous and kind and helpful with uh, the research when I did do the book about John Simmons, the biography um, of himself, uh, 
<laughs> the radical tailor, so to speak, um, and uh, the college that he founded. Um, and also Piper was just wonderful. She squired me all around Little Compton and um, uh, you have made me a big Little Compton fan with all the other uh, wonderful Zooms that I've been able to attend, you know, thanks to you. Oh, um, I did want to tell you um, when you were talking about the um, library science school, mm -hmm. library science wasn't really a credentialized um, a topic yet um, uh, uh, for anyone until about 1906. And Simmons College was indeed one of the first um, to have, uh, I think, with the University of Chicago, perhaps the first colleges to uh, have that as a uh, major and uh, a degree, you know, required um, uh, field. Anyway, uh, the other thing that you mentioned was Elias Howe, and I'd be happy to tell that story. Oh, if please. I, I, you know, so when I worked on this talk uh, for a group from Simmons College last spring, uh -huh. and then I refreshed my memory before this talk, and, and I, ha you know, I have this note, the, the sewing machine race, and I'm like, oh, I remember that was good. And I said, it's in Denise's book, and your, I worked at home today and your book is in the office. So, <laughs> well, so when, please tell uh, us. <laughs> thank you. Um, Elias Howe, uh, most of us think that um, Isaac Singer was the person who invented the sewing machine because of course, you know, it's his name that we associate most of all with um, that particular product. However, it was a man named Elias Howe um, in 1846. He was a mechanic from Springfield, uh, I'm sorry, Spencer, Massachusetts, that's in central Massachusetts, that was working in Boston and he actually was the first person to develop a sewing machine, and he got the first patent in 1846. But as we all know, with technology, you know, the first to produce any kind of uh, technological change is the one that has to bear the greatest amount of costs, startup costs. So he could only price the first sewing machine at $300. This is in 1846, when that was a huge amount of money. Think about, you know, the times when, you know, maybe there were big screen TVs and they started in the, you know, three, $4,000 range, you know, 20 years ago, that kind of thing. It's the same idea with the sewing machine, of course. But what happened was uh, he couldn't sell it. So he decided he'd go to England, you know, where again, they had a huge textile industry, as we all know. Uh, in 1846, he took off because he couldn't sell it. But he left his machine in a shop in Boston. That's where Isaac Singer comes into the picture. He, Isaac Singer, uh, saw the machine and according to a book by um, Harold Evans, who was married to Tina Brown, um, we all sort of know her from, uh, you know, the um, when she was editor of the New Yorker and that's in Vanity Fair and that sort of thing. Uh, her husband wrote a book uh, and it was called They Made America. And he tells the story that when um, Isaac uh, Singer saw this machine uh, in Boston in a, um, a, a warehouse where he was working on a totally different product. Uh, he was in the um, uh, book publishing company uh, uh, field at the time. Uh, he saw it and he said, supposedly, Oh, who would want a machine like that when it would, it would that would keep women from talking all the time? You know, uh, that kind of thing. He he was very pejorative of it. But then he looked at it, and what he did was, in effect, in some ways, probably stole the technology from uh, Elias Howe and uh, put it in. And he changed, he modified the needle, the sewing needle itself, and got his own patent. So that was in 1846. He takes it to New York City, and within a few years, he's he's selling. Oh, and he was able to fix it so that instead of being sold for three hundred dollars, he sold them for fifty dollars. But he was able to make it up in volume because he ended up selling twenty five hundred sewing machines a year in New York City. Then what happened was. Poor Elias Howe comes back from England, happens to land in New York, sees the, sew uh, the, the sewing machine that, uh, in effect, um, Singer has stolen from him, and they get into a lawsuit. And that's how I, the rest of the facts about how Simmons enters the picture, there's a method to my madness with this story, um, <laughs> how he enters the picture, is that uh, it turns out in a deposition when um, Elias Howe was suing uh, singer, you know, for uh, for the uh, infringement on on his um, patent, uh, he, he one of Simmons's uh, chief foreman uh, came through with a deposition, and it turns out that Elias Howe, back in 1846, tried to sell 
the machine to John Simmons and uh, asked him to invest in the company. So what John Simmons did was he said, I'll tell you what, I'll take five of my best seamstresses and uh, play them against one machine. Evidently, the Simmons women, needle women, did very, very good job. But indeed, the sewing machine did a little bit faster and just a little bit better. However, John Simmons, in whatever wisdom he had at the time, decided not to invest. And there's been talk about, did he do this because he realized it would displace so many of his um, uh, working women, you know, that his employees that he, you know, knew were counting on him or not. But one way or another, it was a huge, whether it was a huge, you know, financial miscalculation on his part or for the love of the women that he really cared about enough to start a college for, uh, on whose behalf later, uh, it still happened that way. Uh, and um, so that's the story basically of the sewing machine and how it came into uh, being the way it was. But again, it shows that, you know, even though John Simmons naturally is a hero in some ways, uh, you know, to Simmons graduates, um, he did have his share of, you know, some errors. Uh, but again, it's fascinating because as Marjorie talked about the idea that four sons predeceased him, two daughters disappointed him, and uh, the idea that he really did care about the uh, needlewomen uh, upon whose um, uh, labors his fortune had been made and paying them back was an important thing. And again, this all happened before he intended the college to start in 1870, before um, either Wellesley College uh, 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 and Smith were not in existence yet. They didn't start till 1875, uh, five years later. So he was a trendsetter. It's just that, you know, again, as, as happens in life, sometimes circumstances uh, don't always work out the way we expect them to. Right. But Thank you. Thank so much you. for letting me tell you that story, though. No, no, I was, I, you know, it's so funny. You think you take notes and you think you'll remember the note didn't mean very much to me when I was reading <laughs> I had it. I'll look it up myself. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to take any more questions that people might have. Um, and if not, we wish you a lovely evening. Christine, can you remind us what our next talk is going to be? I think it's me again, unfortunately. Oh, <laughs> unfortunately for right? you, I think it's me again, at least in part. I I actually don't have a newsletter with me. Um, okay. but I, I want to say think it's you and Holly. Um, so I have a wonderful partner with this. I think it's February twenty eighth, twenty sixth, and it's either the twenty uh, seventh or the twenty eighth because the twenty seventh is the Tuesday. And we're calling it Treasures from the Trench. And I am so excited about this. Um, we accidentally did this big archaeology project in back of the Wilbur House a few years ago because we had to put a communication trench in. So it was supposed to be this easy peasy, no big deal job. But the ground surrounding the Wilbur House is so rich with historic artifacts that they were literally poking up out of the dirt piles at us, you know, screaming for us to save them. So it's not true archeology, span it's artifact recovery. We, we saved them from these messed up dirt piles, but we recovered thousands of artifacts. Um, we're having our archeology span partners at Public Archeology span Lab analyze them and uh, write a report for us about what this particular set of artifacts tells us about the lives of the residents of the Wilbur House. And we'll be sharing all of that with you um, in February. And I hope you'll tune in for that. It'll be fun. What year was that, Marjorie, that we had it open for the um, event preview party? Because some of you who well, are listening to us today may have helped us bring out some of those artifacts. So I think it was 22. Um. And anyone well, it was who the was... same year as the house tour. So I think and it that was, was 22. 22. Yeah. Yep. Fred Bridge, Fred Bridge was a big digger. I was a big mm -hmm. digger. Jenna McNewski. Jenna and There's I There's a very had... unflattering photo of me on Facebook wearing all of my layers as I dig for things. Yeah. But it was so much fun. It was. And um, I just, there was one, one moment in particular that was fantastic. We, I, there was a you know, everything's broken. They're all tiny little things. 
a little tiny piece of pottery, very intricate design on it. And just for fun, I was like, I'm going to go see what we have in the pantry at the Wilbur house. Um, and lo and behold, we had exactly the same cup hole, perfect condition on the shelf at the Wilbur house. So um, I don't think I know which one that is. That's so cool. Well, I'll show you. I'll show you Thursday. Um, so, I mean, that was just so great that you, you know, based on these little broken bits and pieces, you can really get a sense of what people's homes looked like. And um, it's not just pottery. It's, you know, uh, nails, all the uh, nails, lots of nails, <laughs> um, overall clasps. I'm not, I'm not saying the right word, but like the little hooks yeah, that yeah. To hold up your overalls and, you know, all kinds of fun things. So, so tune in in February and, um, and Holly and I'll show you some of the wonderful things we saw, found and, and what we think that means about the Wilbers and their workers and their servants and the um, Portuguese immigrants who lived there as well. All right. All right. right. Good night, everyone. Take care. Thank and, you all for coming. Uh, and Thanks. we'll hopefully see you in February. All right. Bye-bye. Good night. <laughs>